morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Mount Poison Congregational Church, where no matter who you are or where you are on this journey, you're welcome here. You're invited to check in on social media if you'd like to, let folks know where you are and why it's a good place to be on a Sunday morning. And if you're visiting with us for the first time, you're uh, invited to fill out one of the visitor's cards, which are in the pews, and put those in the offering plates that are passed during our offering time. And of course, we're all invited to stay after worship, to gather together in our fellowship hall, we'll just call Rainer Hall, uh, for a time of fellowship and coffee during our coffee hour. Coffee hour. We are also looking for folks who enjoy singing, I know many of us do. We may want to join the choir if you, uh, it's easy to do, there are no trials. All you have to do is contact Michelle Gordon, our music director, uh, should you have a desire to be part of our choir. We're still collecting cans for cancer in Rainer Hall. All our empty cans and deposits that go along with them will be donated to the Cancer Society. Now next week we have the final round of our stakeholders meetings. That is, if you are listening to my voice right now, whether seated in the pew or uh, seeing it on cable or next week or whatever, there's still time for you to consider yourself to be a stakeholder in the future of this church. So just sign up for one of those stakeholders meetings following worship next Sunday, October 16th. All you have to do is either email the office or visit the sign-up sheet in Rainer Hall. So please continue to read the bulletin and the spiritually speaking email which comes out on Thursdays about ways to serve and for more announcements from our council, our boards, and our ministry teams. But for now, let us worship the God who blesses and keeps us. Thank you. 
future. Present your best selves before God. Work and witness without pretense. We will bless our God in word and song. Praise be to God. Uh, 
Russia, and just, there's so much noise out there that we want to be reminded not to conform to the things of each world, this world. Many things that we can't control, we want to be concerned and we want to work for justice and peace and change, but not be conformed to this world. That's especially true with these political ads and the campaigns that we're going through. And one of the things that I think uh, Paul was touching on when he said, be not conformed to the things of this world, is that's because perception is not reality. What is perceived many times, the way that it's presented, is not necessarily reality. Let me give you an example. I, after a former hurricane, I once led a group of high school youth on a mission trip to Puerto Rico. We worked on the homes in the southern part of the island, uh, and we also stayed at a camp, uh, at Camp Yukiu, which is near Yukio, which is uh, kind of up on the, on the edge of the rainforest, the only rainforest in the U.S. territory, the only tropical rainforest. And it was a wonderful trip. We did lots of great work, uh, not only on some homes, but also at the camp. So there were 18 of us, and we got to the airport to fly back to Chicago. And our flight got canceled. So I had all these kids in an airport and trying to corral them and the adult leaders as well for seven hours until the next flight to Chicago was scheduled to leave. Well, I worked with the gate agent feverishly. She was a wonderful lady. Um, trying to get all of these different kids in a spot here, a spot there, and the adult leaders on each of the seats that were left on this aircraft, because we were all on standby. And what happened is every single person in the group was able to get a seat on that flight, except one. <laughs> now, I, now you guys, I told your families that I'll get you back to Chicago safe and, and, and well and everything. So I'll get there on my own at another time, but you know, we'll still have the same people come to pick us up and, and everything at the airport, so you'll be fine. The other adult leaders in Malaysia, uh, but there's no seat for me on this flight, so I'm probably going to have to spend the night and try something tomorrow. So I'm the skate agent who I've worked with uh, trying to get these kids and, and, and their leaders on this flight it was wonderful. So I figured I'd just sit there until they, they took off and start reading my book. And then she came up to me and she said, Mr. Wolf, we have no show in first class. <laughs> we haven't closed the door yet. You've been so wonderful, I'd like to give you that seat. And I said, well, thank you very much. So I snuck on right before the door, door closed to the jetway. And all of the youth group was in coach. And I turned left to <laughs> they could see me with my fully reclining seat, my glass of wine, my hot towel, all the wonderful things that my music to get in the tape for and was to watch the movie, all this wonderful thing to fly back. And when we landed in O'Hare in Chicago, I got to get off first too. So I got off and I went to down the escalator to baggage claim and I just stood there. And then all of a sudden all these youths are coming, Rich, Rich, how did you get here? Because they thought I was still at the gate back and forth. How did you get here? And I, I can only say, it's a miracle. <laughs> Proving that perception is not reality. Do not be conformed to the things of this world. Amen.
Now listen with me for the word of God from Luke's gospel this morning. As we find the story of Jesus healing the ten lepers. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. May God have understanding for a hearing of this holy word. Amen. As I mentioned, as the hurricane season continues to cause pain and damage this year, I've been thinking this last week about a trip Margaret and I took to New Orleans less than two years after Katrina devastated that area. And according to the people we met there, the French Quarter and the downtown area of the city had returned to about 50% of what they once were, and the tourist industry was slowly recovering. The outlying areas were still heavily damaged or abandoned altogether. And our young cousin, a recent college graduate, had taken a position through Teach for America to instruct middle school students in reading and writing. So we visited with her and saw her school in a small port town across the Mississippi River from New Orleans proper. And of course, the other main reason for the trip was to eat big, eat often, and eat well. And please report that all tasks were out. Well, one afternoon we hopped on a streetcar to head back to our hotel. And no, the streetcar's name was not Desire, but two of the streetcar lines were up and running, while several others had not been repaired yet, post Katrina. Now, on this particular ride, I found myself yelling, Stop! The driver released the brake. The car kind of lurched, then it stopped, and in front of the car, just on the other side of the windshield, with a camera-covered face, was a tourist standing in front of the streetcar on the tracks. He was taking a picture of the driver through the front window while standing in front of the car. Neither the passengers nor the idiot with the camera was armed. Apparently, the guy with the camera believed that he was at a Disney attraction or something, instead of a working mass transit line. It's the same reason an average of 12 people die each year at the Grand Canyon. They have a perception of safety in a public place, so they step over fences, climb on rocks, and fall to their demise. I call it the disnification of travel. If there are other tourists around, it must be safe. But I'm sure you can relate if you've ever been a tourist. When we travel, we see things that look odd to us, but are commonplace to the native folks. I recall thinking a strange thought when I was on one sabbatical, studying in Berlin for a few weeks, and I was riding a bicycle through the quaint town of Potsdam, trying to keep up with the mom, dad, and two kids who were my hosts for the week in Berlin. The strange thought I had is the idyllic family rode through the beautiful park by the lake on the way to grandparents' house was this. Oh, so this is where all the naked people hang out. I would probably not experience that riding through Shipyard Park. <laughs> At least I would hope not during the gazebo band concert. But when we are tourists, we also have to become informed about where and when not to do our 
tourist thing. While on that trip to New Orleans, we took a carriage ride through and around the French Quarter, pulled by a mule with a top speed around six miles per hour, appropriately named Blaze. Now, Blaze's encourager and our narrator was Howard. And when we got to one area, Howard admonished us all in the carriage, stay away from that area over there, the far side of the cemetery. There's a lot of crime and muggings. And in his drawl, he cautioned, that's where people that know the income will take your income. <laughs> well, in our story from Luke, Jesus was a tourist. He was traveling through a not so great part of Palestine called Samaria. And the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along, to put it mildly. The Jews considered the Samaritans to be unclean, and the Samaritans felt Jews acted superior. I bet their high schools had a fierce football rivalry too, but I have not found any scholars to back me up on this. So Jesus was traveling through Samaria. A tourist in a bad part of town. Now some people make the boundaries, but Jesus breaks the boundaries. And it's our call to follow him in this. You can only imagine what the disciples thought and said, uh, Master, why are we here? Shouldn't we have taken a bypass instead of going through this part of town? Do you know this is where the lepers and the undesirables live on the rabbi? Are you sure we want to be here? Didn't Shemaleah recommend a better route to Jerusalem? Well, sure enough. They encountered a group of ten outcasts and diseased individuals. Some locals. He crosses his safe boundaries and meets a group of people who are on the margins of society. Lepers. He heals them despite the strict prohibitions against having any contact with such people. He sends them away to give thanks for their healing and show themselves to the priests as proof. And only one of them returns to thank Jesus. And it was the Samaritan man, the local, who was the only one to give thanks to the tourist. Now, most often when this episode is preached, it's a morality tale about us giving thanks to God. It should be a story that reminds us to give thanks to God when we are blessed, just like the one Samaritan. We should all do this. Yes, it's a good lesson, but I want you to think about the story with me in a slightly different way. That the story is not just about giving thanks as much as it is, is about insiders and outsiders about tourists and locals, about Jews and Samaritans, about us and them with props to Pink Floyd. It's about Jesus going outside of his own and his followers' comfort zones to serve others. As we consider our stewardship ministry in these approaching weeks in October, we remind ourselves that this is what the ministry of the church is all about. Leaving our comfort zones to serve both those in the church and those outside the church. From the little free library supporting first responders. From helping to feed those at Mercy Meals and more to serving those on the streets through the Inner Church Council. From supporting a family at the time of death or visiting a member with dementia who does not know who the visitor is, but it's a smile on the face. From partnering with those responding to the needs of immigrants, to providing pastoral services to the community. People make the boundaries, but Jesus breaks the boundaries. And as his church, so do we. Breaking boundaries to serve. Jane Hall has traveled the world as a tourist and as a Peace Corps volunteer. Her work has included establishing micro-business opportunities for women in Central American countries, including a ceramics 
cooperative in rural Nicaragua, Jane tells us this story. She writes, a clay pot sits alone on top of my bookshelf. It measures about eight inches tall. The shelf is reserved for the single piece of pottery. I'm constantly clearing away books, papers, and other things that accumulate here. People visiting my apartment often comment on the pot, perhaps because they're attracted to the simplicity of the design, or maybe because it seems odd that I have given such an ordinary vessel a shelf of its own in an otherwise cluttered space. But that doesn't bother me or the pot. It stands there steadfast and proud. I look at it every day. Sometimes I turn the pot over to look at the base where the artist's name, Pilar, is chiseled in childlike letters. My work in developing the World Pottery Project in Nicaragua led me up the steep hills to Las Chaquites, a brittle, sun-baked settlement. It is usually labeled inaccessible. I was searching for communities where the women had a tradition of working with clay. It was on my first trip walking around this isolated gathering of mud and stay homes, four hours by foot from the nearest road, that I met Doña Pilar and her family. They offered me a stool in the shade and answered some of my questions about their town. When I pulled out my camera to photograph several pieces of pottery they brought out of their home, they insisted that the photo would be much nicer with people in it. I willingly obliged their request for a family portrait. A few weeks later, I returned to conduct a pottery workshop. As I climbed over the fence to the dirt patio surrounding Doña Pilar's house, she came running out to greet me with a generous hug. ¿Y la foto? She asked hopefully. I pulled the photograph from my backpack. The family, nine people in all, looked very handsome indeed with a clear resemblance to one another. Doña Pilar studied the image carefully. After a long lapse of silence, she pointed to a short, gray-haired, grandmotherly woman in a faded blue dress, held together precariously by safety pins. And she asked timidly, Is this me? I realized at that moment that Pilar clearly had no idea what she looked like. I asked if she ever owned a mirror. She said, Yes, there used to be one in the house, but it broke many years ago. Occasionally, she says, the sun is right, she sees part of her reflection in a jug of water. This is rare, as whatever water there is, she was scooped out from an underground spring, cut by cup using a long string with a tin can tied to the end. I asked her what it's like to not see herself regularly. I know who I am inside, she replied, and that's what I see every day. Boundaries. Comfort zones. How far away is a village where the people do not even own mirrors to see and know what they look like? When we look in our mirrors, God encourages us to ask that very question. People make the boundaries. Jesus breaks the boundaries. It's our call to follow them. Amen. Each of us who thirst for your truth may be refreshed. 
Refresh our hearts and minds so our praise may be faithful, our prayers honest, and our lives a witness to your grace. Liberating God, you consistently call to us to open our ears to your teaching and to tune our hearts to your love. Yet we're like the child in the other room who somehow cannot hear the parent calling. We confess that we quarrel, we forget, we refuse, we wander, and after all our foolishness, we still cry out, where is God? O God of forgiving, loving grace, have mercy upon us. Open us to the power of your Holy Spirit that we may be filled to overflowing with your love and life. Holy God, you are the author and miracle of life. You are our wholeness and our salvation. You are our freedom and our laughter. You hold us together in this community. You heal our brokenness. And now you open yourself to us, lifting us into a oneness of heart with you that is called prayer. It is breathtaking. Our words tumble out of us, scattered and inadequate, give meaning to the yearnings of our souls. We dream, dear God, of a church that is led by your Spirit. Transform the words of our faith into discipleship and mission. We dream, dear God, of a servant church with no mission but to obediently serve our Lord Jesus. Turn our dreams into action, into ministries of love. Give our hearts to your song. For your song is love. Teach us to love with holy passion that embraces all people as sisters and brothers. A holy passion that recognizes the welfare of another as our welfare. O oh God, your song is wholeness and salvation. You hear our sighs, you count our tears, you respond. Our lives are being lived in the brokenness of disease. In poverty or imprisonment, in grief or desolation, may we hear your song with devotion. Place your healing touch upon the wounds of our lives and grant us relief, release, and rescue. There is now, Lord God, as we come to you with the prayers of our hearts in silence.
For the task you have called us to do, we give you thanks, gracious God. We offer these gifts as we offer ourselves to your work. We pray that you would bless them to your use. Amen. Thank you. 